this talk began life as a fairly straightforward account of the creation and characteristics of one of the most impressive printed maps produced in 17th century England. But I'm speaking here today because the maker of that map, Jonas Moore, eventually became a fellow of the Royal Society. So it seems a good idea to begin by briefly describing his whole career and his Royal Society links in the later years of his life before focusing on the middle part of it when he worked in the Fens. My introductory illustration shows the earliest portrait we have of him. Here is, quote, mathematical more, that was John Aubrey's phrase, seen in the frontispiece to the first edition of his arithmetic. This was published in 1650, just before he secured appointment as surveyor to the 5th Earl of Bedford's Fen Drainage Company. So it aptly represents the first stage of his career. Jonas was born in 1618 in rural Lancashire as the second son of a reasonably prosperous yeoman farmer living at Whiteley near Higham in the Pendle Forest District. This was a region where yeomen had tended to do rather well out of the 16th century economic developments, many building themselves new houses like this one, and gradually turning in, into minor gentry. Jonas's social circle in his youth included two higher-ranking gentry families, the Shuttleworths of Gawthorpe, which you may know as it's now a National Trust House, and the Shuttleworths were Presbyterians, and the Roman Catholic Townleys of Townley, which now belongs to Burnley Corporation, I think. The Townleys owned a significant library of mathematical and scientific books, to which Jonas at some point gained access. He must have been educated in a local grammar school, there were several of those, and his first employment from 1637 was as a notary and clerk in the ecclesiastical courts of the Bishop of Durham. He married in Durham and could have settled there, were it not for the upheavals of the Civil War period. As bishops were formally abolished in 1642, so was his job. But even before this, he'd been forced to retreat from the city by the Scottish invasion of 1640. He appears to have sent his family back to Lancashire around that time. But in the preface to one of his arithmetics, he claims that he personally took refuge at Bransmith a few miles from Durham, and began to study mathematics under the tutorship of William Milburn, a Cambridge man who was curate there. Back to the man himself for a minute. We know nothing of what he did in the actual Civil War years. Curiously, a friend of mine has discovered his name written in a manuscript volume in an Oxford college somewhere around 1645 but I'm afraid I have been unable to verify that that really was his signature. It's possible. All we know for certain is that in 1646, he came to public notice as a pupil and disciple of the well-known mathematician William Outred, then resident at Albury in Surrey. By the end of the 1640s, Moore was living in London and earning his livelihood from mathematics, principally by teaching it. His most distinguished pupil was James, Duke of York, whom he taught for a few months while the royal children were in the custody of Parliament. We know that Moore didn't regard himself purely as a teacher, as his 1650 arithmetic very cheerfully lists in its preface all the other works he could publish, given suitable encouragement. They are The Perfect Geometer and Commentaries on Euclid, the mechanic containing the practice of geometry in surveying fortification, architecture, etc. A work on instruments for improving the senses of sight and hearing, including telescopes. A work on conic sections and an astronomy. These did not actually all exist. Possibly none of them did at that time. But the breadth of his notional ambition puts him squarely in the ranks of mathematical practitioners people who, in order to earn a living in a precarious world, 
would turn their hand to any subject or practical cut task requiring mathematical competence. And it's clear that Moore was capable of fulfilling at least some of the claims of his own advertisement. His success in the 1650s in the post of surveyor to the 5th Earl of Bedford's Fen Drainage Company demonstrates his expertise and considerable determination. It paid a substantial salary and kept him away from London for about seven years, but he was settled back there by the time the monarchy was restored in 1660. He marked that event by publishing a new edition of his arithmetic. You can see he looks considerably older and stouter by this time. And this volume has prefatory matter in which he laid claim to royalist friends and tried to imply that he'd been on the right side all along. This was just what you had to say in 1660. It doesn't sound very convincing now. But at the time, it seems to have been enough to preserve his reputation. He swiftly renewed his acquaintance with the Duke of York and is described as the Duke's surveyor on a panorama of Tangier that he drew in 1663 after he'd accompanied the Earl of Sandwich's expedition to take over the place from the Portuguese. It was undoubtedly the Duke's patronage that secured Moore a role in the Ordnance Office and he soon moved on from an assistance post in 1665 to be appointed Surveyor General in 1669. He was to hold that senior post until his death ten years later and secured the reversion of the post for his only son. Moore was knighted in 1673 as a reward for loyal service in the Third Dutch War. As his official duties were much reduced once the war had ended, he had plenty of time in the next few years to devote to pursuing his old established interest in astronomy. It was largely as a result of his actions that the Royal Observatory was founded in March 1675, with his protégé John Flamsteed as its first director, and Moore himself paying for all its major instruments. In the course of this campaign, in December 1674, he was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society. Existing members of the Society sought to recruit him rather than the other way round, as they were keen on seeing an observatory founded. Emulating Paris was one of the motives here. And of course, they recognised the many and shining virtues of a wealthy benefactor. Moore had had occasional contact with the Society before this, and was in particular a friend and supporter of Robert Hooke's. He remained a moderately active member of the society until his death. So this was a career with quite an impressive tra tragic trajectory. I knew I wouldn't be able to say that. From relatively obscure provincial origins to a responsible and fairly lucrative job with court connections. His work in the Fens occupied a central place in this, playing an important role in securing his advancement. So we now need to turn to the Fens and look at what his task there involved. Um, a little bit of basic geography and a brief history of drainage attempts might be useful as an introduction here. Um, this is one of H.C. Darby's outlined maps of the Fens. Um, sorry, it's a bit blurry, but it's good enough to give a rough impression of the size and problems of, of the region. Stretching from just north of Cambridge up to the Wash, the Fens constitute an area of about 60 miles by 40 at its widest. They consisted of silt fen on the north side, low-lying but relatively well-drained, and on the south, the peat fen. It was the peat fen that experienced the greatest problems with flooding, and that was probably getting worse from the late 16th century onwards as a result of climatic fluctuations. Um, Oliver Rackham's History of the Countryside gives some details of the basic climatic patterns, if you're interested in following that up. These worsening conditions coincided with a growing awareness amongst the English 
of the su successful use of drainage technology in the Netherlands and the possible virtues of replacing piecemeal local attempts at drainage by one great general scheme for the Fens as, the, as a whole. A series of investigations took place. An enabling Act of Parliament was passed in 1600. An abortive project soon afterwards created a single new channel, Popham's O. And then a more substantial scheme was implemented in the 1630s by a company headed by the 4th Earl of Bedford. That one almost succeeded, reaching the stage of shares of Fen land being distributed to the investors. But then it was declared that the drainage was inadequate, producing only summer grounds, not protection through the winters. And Charles I stepped in with the hope of completing the work for his own profit. Charles I was always after money. The Civil War interrupted everything, and once Parliament had won, heirs of the 1630s drainage company set about getting the project revived. An Act of Parliament in their favour was passed in the spring of 1649, a few months after the King's execution. Now, this is one of my favourite frontispieces. Um, you will see at the top there the Civil War armies, and below they are beating their swords into ploughshares. Down the bottom, here are the, the tools of, of drainage and a surveyor with a, a level um, doing his work for the drainers. Um, so, yes, a, a splendid frontispiece from Walter Blythe. It actually took the, the drainage company some months to get themselves organised and to reach an agreement with Cornelius Vermoyden, who had claims as a result of his association with Charles I. Vermoyden was eventually accepted as technical director, but was excluded from any role in the day-to-day -day conduct of the company's business. It took even longer for the company to find a surveyor. They first attempted to contact someone who'd worked for the fourth earl in the 1630s, a man called Benjamin Hare, but this failed. Basically, they, they took a messenger and said, he lives in Hertfordshire, go and have a look. And this, yeah, he came back about a week later and said he'd tried and didn't work. Moore then had a chance to apply, aided by one or more of his patrons, chiefly an MP called Edmund Wilde. As sole candidate for a demanding job in an unhealthy part of the country, Moore was in a strong position to negotiate and secured a salary of £200 a year, considerably more than the, cons the company had originally planned to pay for a surveyor. He was ordered to set out for the Fens on the 2nd of September 1650, just a few days after the meeting that appointed him, and agreed to produce his first map of the area north of Bedford River by late October. So far as we know, he did that, but completing a survey of the whole region was a much slower business. His great printed wall map of the Fens wasn't published until late 1657 or early 1658. By this time, the main phase of the drainage project was over. The drainage company had been granted permanent incorporation, which happened in 1656, and Moore was in the process of moving back to London to develop his career in new ways. I'm not going to spend much time here describing the practical methods and instruments used by the 17th century Fen surveyors, but I will just show you this illustration taken again from Walter Blythe. Um, in producing his improved volume, Blythe had visited the Fens. He puts in a whole new chapter about the Fens. So this is very probably drawn on the spot and could well be a portrait of Moore and one of his assistants. They have here a plain level, which is that one, and a water level, and the fancier item here is a theodolite being used as a level. In contrast, the only surveying instruments directly mentioned in the drainage company's accounting records are the measuring chain and the plain table, which is something much simpler 
than a theodolite and much easier to carry around with you over difficult terrain. For the surveyors, existing maps must have been a useful resource. The earliest known general map of the Fens was drawn by John Hexham and Ralph Agus in the late 16th century for Lord Burley. William Hayward is believed to have had access to their map when he set about drawing his general map of the Fens for Popham's associates around 1604. Hayward's was to become the most important and influential map of the region. Complemented by a verbal description of bounds, it formed part of the legal definition of the Fenland that made it possible to run and fund the drainage enterprise in the 1630s and 1650s. It was also presumably the basis for sectional maps that appear in the company's lot books in the 1630s, listening, listing which investor got which piece of land. It now survives only in copies, and this obviously is a relatively late printed one. Um, there's a, a rather a fine manuscript copy from 1727 in Cambridgeshire archives. So in the 1720s, this is, this is still a relevant map. In county maps, the, the fens were depicted in a very vague way generally, but a reduced copy of Hayward's map in Sir Robert Cotton's hands is believed to have provided the basis for maps printed in the Netherlands, of which this is one example. And the earliest one of them, printed by Henry Hondius in Amsterdam in 1632. The cartographical detail shows up reasonably well on the uncoloured example. I'm also giving you a uh, uh, rather gently coloured one for comparison. Um, at the bottom left and right, you have the tools of the drainer and the farmer. And on the right here, you have quite a, a substantial block of text uh, listing the drainage investors of, of the 1630s and saying, yeah, what a wonderful job they're doing. Hondius was then copied by other Dutch publishers, Johannes Janssen and Johannes Blau. This is Blau's version, published in 1645. It's essentially the same as Hondius, with some new ornamentation, a uh, fancier set of tools, perhaps. And the text, obviously, has been omitted as it was out of date by then. But this particular copy is, is nice because it illustrates how judicious colouring could turn any version of this map into a piece of dramatic pro-drainage propaganda. You shade in all of the middle and convince people that the whole central area is completely underwater. And the new title is Regiones Inundatae, Flooded Regions. This was, of course, never entirely true in the way it's shown here. But if you wanted to convince somebody that this area needed draining, this is a pretty good way of going about it. Back to Jonas Moore himself. And when he was a appointed surveyor to the drainage company in 1650, some version of Hayward's map must have been available to him. He also retrieved a variety of other manuscript maps, that had been left behind by the company in the 1630s. A sum of 36 shillings was paid to one Mr. William Lane for 28 maps, and more were found in the hands of an innkeeper in the town of March. All of these maps would have had some continuing practical uses, but there wasn't anything among them that would fully serve the longer-term needs of the drainers of the 1650s as they struggled to convince adjudication commissioners of their success and began to think about displaying the results of their enterprise in a printed form. What Moore agreed on his appointment was, quote, to survey the great level of the fens and to make an exact map of that part thereof which lies on the north side of Bedford River by the 23rd of October next, and of the other part thereof lying on the south side of Bedford River inconvenient time afterwards. That last clause, of course, was a rather handy get-out. 
It's not surprising that as he became involved in other business, helping to set out and supervise the works undertaken, directing a fluctuating and sometimes unreliable team of under surveyors, all of them working under less than ideal conditions, Moore didn't find the time to pursue the idea of producing a complete general map on any large scale. A small map of the whole Fenland with the drainage works was printed in 1654 at the drainage company's expense. The company employed the well-known engraver William Faithorne to work on it and paid him £13 for the job. The map is probably identifiable with an undated single sheet one at a scale of slightly less than half an inch to the mile, entitled A True Map of the Great Level of the Fens as it now lieth drained with the great works made at the cost and charges of the Right Honourable William Earl of Bedford, his participants and the adventurers for the perfect draining thereof described by Jonas Moore. This survives in the British Library. Um, it's fairly similar but not identical to a map that William Dugdale later included in his him history of embanking and draining. I'm afraid I just have a, a picture of the Dugdale one. Um, as I say, they, they are essentially pretty similar and both oriented with south at the top, just to confuse everybody. Um, but there was no standardisation at that date as to which way a map should be oriented. In a letter noted in the company's proceedings on the 16th of February 1654, so after the company had begun to make arrangements for the small map, Moore was firmly told that, quote, the company are very much troubled that they have not as yet a map of the whole level, setting forth how the adventure land is taken from the country and how it is set out in the lot divisions, of which they desire a speedy account. End of quote. Moore's proposal for printing such a map was recorded soon afterwards, apparently before any detailed general map actually existed in manuscript. On the 31st of March 1654, a meeting at Ely resolved that, quote, whereas Mr. Jonas Moore, the surveyor, hath undertaken to present to the company one general complete map of the whole level of the fens with the adventure land and lot divisions at or before Michaelmas next, along with other maps and a book listing the land and names of the adventurers and participants, it is thereupon ordered that he shall be allowed the charge of the vellum and he shall have liberty, after the same are done, to print all or any part of the said maps and to dispose of the same to his best profit and advantage. End of quote. This, given the reference to the cost of vellum and potential to print parts separately, must mark the initiation of the 16-sheet map, though it wasn't actually published for another three or four years. In the 1660 edition of his arithmetic, Moore states that, having with me Mr John Goddard, an excellent workman at my house in Norfolk, graving me plates for the great level of the fens, I caused him at spare hours to cut me the schemes for this book. Poor old Goddard, never got any time off. Moore appears to have paid for engraving the map himself, as the company's order envisaged. The cost of engraving 16 sheets was probably at least £160. Calculating from Faithorne's price for one plate, the total may have risen to over 200 equivalent to Moore's original annual salary from the company. But Goddard was undoubtedly a cheaper workman than Faithorne and may well have been chosen partly for that reason. Moore and Elliot, his chief assistant, were allowed travelling expenses to go to London, quote, about the map, at least three times. Moore in May 1657, Elliot in November 1657, by which time Moore himself had probably moved back to London, and Elliot again in the following May. We can guess, therefore, that the map was probably published in the first half of 1658. It seems to have retailed at 50 shillings a copy, uncoloured. 
And here it is, a small part of it. The resulting printed map was an impressive production at a scale of about two inches to the mile. Its 16 sheets, assembled and backed, create a map about six feet wide by four foot six high. This sheet from the lower left corner is one of the most decorative um, as it has the company's coat of arms and also some of those of, of the drainage investors and those, the personal arms go all the way around the edge of the map. The company's arms in the 1650s, the ones given here, were evidently the same as those granted to the forerunner company in 1636. So here they provide a way of claiming a continuity between, between the two projects and their participants, although the actual continuity of people is, is relatively small. Here's the opposite corner with more of the coats of arms. Uh, the presence of those of Secretary Thurlow and many other loyal Cromwellians gave the map an unmistakable political complexion, which would very briefly have seemed like a good thing to the drainage company and others. And there are several of Cromwell's major generals in there, for instance. The dramatic reversal of this situation that followed upon the restoration of the monarchy about two years after the map was published helps to explain why only a single copy of this first printing is known to survive. It's now preserved in the National Archives, having arrived there as part of the Duchy of Lancaster records, presumably because the duchy held land in the region or had some link. The politics of the matter also explains why later reprints were produced without the personal coats of arms, with all the borders completely blanked out and only partially filled in by some odd little bits of extra cartography. So the later editions really do look a bit odd. Ornamentation with coat, coats of arms at the outset was a conventional choice. At this period, heraldic decoration was common on manuscript and printed maps. The products of continental map publishers provided plenty of precedents, and the practice had been readily taken up in England. But coats of arms also had a place in the tradition of estate mapping, which had arisen in England from the later part of the 16th century, with the arrival of new surveying instruments and promotion of ideas of mathematical accuracy. And I'd like to suggest that it's very much to the practical estate mapping tradition that Moore's map of the great level belongs. For instance, the edge, as you can see here, has a scale of miles and furlongs, where the conventions of mapping of a more cosmographical kind would expect latitude and longitude. If we move away from the edge and look at an extract from the interior. This is the sheet of the area around Ramsey and Chatteris. I've also, oh, that's not going, that's not very clear. No, I'll go back to that one. Okay. Um, yeah, the may, most um, dramatic feature of, of the whole map is the contrast between the irregular lines of the old landscape and the straight lines of the new channels. Um, well, I'll try and point without having the, the more close-up one. That's Chatteris with inhabited buildings. There are a few landmark church towers shown, especially around the edge. The surveyors would have used those for landmarks where they could. And south of Ramsey, over here somewhere, you can see Colonel Cromwell's Park. The lots, such as these here, are numbered and marked with acreages. And there are a few additional notes. One about an exchange of land just south of Vermoyden's Drain, which I think is that bit. And there's another note about the acreage of Warboy's Fen before this great work was begun. And features of this kind will be very familiar 
to anyone used to handling estate maps. We'll skip over that one. Again, this is um, a place where you can see the contrast between the established landscape with all its wiggly lines and the drainers' innovations. This is my favourite sheet of the map, I have to say, for that, that reason. Uh, it shows the lines of the old and new Bedford rivers on the left there, cutting across the winding course of the old Croft River, which goes down to join the Ouse somewhere there. And the old Croft River still has its pattern of, of tiny irregular crofts. I don't know whether... No, that's close up. Sorry, whoops. Close up one isn't going to work either. Anyway, that, that's the, uh, the main point, is, is the contrast between the new straight lines and the straight lines of the allotments of land, such as that batch there, and the remnants of the former landscape. Accuracy, in the sense of precise representation of any of these features, in accordance with the stated scale, is not something that most contemporaries would have regarded in anything resembling modern terms. Sorry, I'm going to just skip back to there for the moment. But so far, you have to try and, and ask the question, how accurate is Moore's map? And so far as I can judge, a good standard was achieved. Checking the distances between places shows no very noticeable discrepancies from modern figures. Checking adventurers' plots against figures on the large-scale ordnance survey reveals less than two acres apparently now missing out of what was supposed to be a thousand acres. The company's proceedings books also show remarkably little evidence of any disputes arising over the quality of surveying, though that isn't completely conclusive, as there were probably no surveyors around in the Fens who weren't already working for the drainage company. So if anybody wanted to challenge a company surveyor's work, there was no ready source of expert opinion to call upon to back you up. But still, the overall, overall impression given is that the accuracy achieved both in measurements in the field and in their represent, representation on paper, was fairly high. The question of honesty of representation is a slightly different one, but a question that's also worth asking. After all, one of Moore's later products, his large map of the port of Tangier, shows a view that's entirely fictitious, representing how it might look one day if a great harbour wall were to be built, and it was never actually finished. The Fens map can't be a work of the imagination in quite the same way as that one was, but the cartographer nevertheless had to make some choices that could have had a subjective element. The fact that numerous small changes were made to the plates of the map for the second edition indicates that the first edition was understood as representing the state of things at a particular point in history. Whilst in practice there never was a single point at which the drainage project came to an end in such a way that the map could be definitive, constant maintenance and fiddling about with things was one of its, its uh, standard characteristics. And the process of preparing the map itself took some time, so there's a possibility that Moore might have included features that he expected would be finished by the time of publication, but which had no more than a theoretical existence. That's rather a complex matter to pursue, and I haven't been able to do anything about it myself, but a facsimile map is going to be published by Cambridge Records Society, and once that has happened, perhaps local historians will be able to explore some of these kinds of questions and really look at the details on the ground and how much really was as the map shows it. Anyway, despite those caveats, we have to say that the end result of Moore's enterprise was an extremely impressive map. It recorded the company's achievements in a very vivid and dramatic manner, 
for anybody who'd got a wall that could take something six foot by four foot six, as well as commemorating Moore's own participation in the project and advertising his mathematical skills at a point when he was in need of a new job. The names of officers and leading members of the company were perpetuated, not only by the inclusion of their arms, but in the names of the new channels, as well as the old and new Bedford rivers, drains were called after Vermoyden, Thurlow, Henley, Underwood, Hammond and Moore himself. Moore's drain is now known as the 20-foot river, but some of the other names do still survive. In a sense, the map wasn't purely Moore's own work, as it drew on elements of other people's in various ways. The work of previous cartographers and, lab and the labours of the under-surveyors who'd worked in the Fens. The published map was, of course, made possible at all by the fact that it was backed by the drainage company, which paid for the initial surveying. It was the underlying cost of such new surveys that discouraged most similar publishing ventures in the 17th century. But I believe Moore still deserves most of the credit he claimed for putting it all together and funding and supervising its engraving and publishing. The map isn't entirely outside the run of characteristic products of the late 1650s. It, oh, sorry, that one. It appeared at a point when the London map trade was showing signs of expanding and being ready to take on larger ventures. Some of this upturn must be attributable to the First Navigation Act of 1651 and the First Anglo-Dutch War, 1652 to 4, as the disruption of trade opened up opportunities for English makers. And perhaps the war itself changed their attitude to one of more spirited competition with Dutch publishers. Importing continued, but English products began to appear in increasing variety. John Goddard, Moore's engraver, supplied maps of continents for an edition of Peter Halin's Cosmography in 1652. By the end of that year, William Faithorne was back in London after an interlude in France. He went on to thrive as the leading importer of foreign prints. As an engraver, he was best known for portraits, but he also produced frontispieces and ventured into cartography on an ambitious scale by engraving the map you see here, Richard Newcourt's 12-sheet map of London, produced in 1658. I believe this comes from a copy produced by the London Topographical Society some while ago. Newcourt's venture, based on a survey made in the 1640s, at a scale of about 14 inches to the mile, was the first of its kind and the precursor to a, no to a now more widely known London wall map produced by John Ogilby and William Morgan in 1682. The fact that Faithorne was working on this time-consuming project around the time when Moore was seeking an engraver may be an alternative or additional explanation for Moore's having ended up employing Goddard. I would claim that Moore's map is in the same league with, as Newcourt's, not ahead of its time perhaps, but certainly at the forefront, as one of the boldest and most visually stunning products of the 1650s. Its influence on later maps seems to have been limited, at least until the publication of Samuel Wells's map, accompanying his history of the drainage of the Great Level in 1828. But the fact that Moore's map continued to be reprinted into the 19th century means that no substitute for it was in fact needed. I'd like to add a few more words here about the second and later editions, as these are the ones that are most familiar to historians, but I'm going to have to make it fairly brief because of the, the time we have left. The second edition was produced in 1684 by Moses Pitt. It has blank edges where the coats of arms have been removed, with just a little added cartography, as I said. It also incorporates a large number of small alterations in the interior sheets, new drainage channels and so forth. 
We know that the, the drainage company resolved Sir Jonas Moore to new make the map in May 1677, and I suspect these many minor revisions were made soon after that in Moore's own lifetime. Like the first edition, the second survives in a single known copy, and that's now amongst the Goff map series in the Bodleian. No further alterations were made for the third edition of around 1706, which bears the name of Christopher Brown. There are indications that this last one was reprinted several times over a long period, though always with Brown's name, and one copy is on paper watermarked 1824. This undoubtedly explains why copies of the Brown edition are relatively common in local collections. A condensed version, which is this one, in a single sheet, came out in 1720, produced by Thomas Cox. And that's the kind of thing that often happened to wall maps at this period, as a smaller, cheaper version could reach a wider market. The tactic continues to be effective. A coloured version of this map has been published by Cambridge City Library, and you can still buy one. I'll just conclude with, with this one as the final slide, the, the afterlife of the map. And I'll just mention again that Moore's map itself will fairly shortly be published in a facsimile edition by Cambridgeshire Record Society. And that'll be a paper copy of the first edition and electronic copies of that and the second and some, something of the Christopher Brown edition. Uh, it will also include a commentary by me and short biographies of all the people represented by the coats of arms, mostly prepared by Liz, Stag Liz Stazica. And this is, of course, why it's taking a little time to complete it. But we do hope it will be out soon. Thank you.